the problem with the Arab world, I actually reversed it. I said, let's go to the Arab world and let's get peace with the Arab world and then lose sight of the Judeo-Christian beliefs that built our society. This is why it is so important to study scripture. The old guard still say, no, no, we have to, uh, you know, we have to go to the Palestinians before we go to the Arab world and we'll never get peace. In today's world, we sometimes lose sight of the Judeo-Christian beliefs that built our society. This is why it is so important to study scripture and develop a dedicated prayer life. There's no better way to do that than with Hallow. Hallow is the number one Christian prayer app in the US and the number one Catholic app in the world. It's filled with studies, meditations, and reflections, including the number one Christian podcast, The Bible in a Year. Download Hallow today and try their Advent Pray 25 Challenge a 25-day journey through Bible stories from both the Old and New Testament leading up to the birth of Jesus. These meditations are led by cast members from the largest Christian streaming series in history, The Chosen. Advent Pray 25 will help grow your understanding of mankind and develop a disciplined prayer habit during a season when our discipline is put to the test. Download Hallow for three months completely free and experience a personal development that can come from regular prayer, meditation, and reflection on who the Bible calls us to be. Get Hallow for free at hallow.com slash Jordan. That's hallow.com slash Jordan. Give yourself the gift of peace, calm, and discipline this Christmas. Go to hallow.com slash Jordan today. So I want to I want to divide this into two tracks now. I want to I want to first of all investigate uh, some of the history behind the willingness of other states to support the Jewish claim to a homeland in the Middle East, because I think that's quite interesting. And then I want to speak more about the Abraham Accords, which you discussed. So one of the things that fascinated me, well, historically, but also in your book, is your discussion of the of the Balfour Declaration. And so that's obviously before the utter catastrophe of the Holocaust and the catastrophes the Jewish people ran into in the mid middle of the 20th century. By already, by the time of the Balfour Declaration, there was some sense, at least in Great Britain, that the, the claim that Herzl had put forward, for example, that the Jews and the world would benefit from a Jewish homeland in the Middle East had some validity. So why, why do you think that developed? And, and then how do you think it extended? Because you got bi bipartisan support for the notion of a Jewish homeland from the Americans by 1944. And then, of course, there was the UN 1947 declaration. So it's, it's not as if the Jews imposed this vision on the Middle East by themselves. There was support all over the world. And so I'm, I'm, could you walk us through how that, how that support developed? Well, why you think it developed? Yeah, it developed because, uh, because of the, uh, certainly in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, um, there was a, a, the propaganda that I described, rewriting the history, had not taken root. And uh, most educated people knew the history of the Bible, the history of the Jewish people, their dispossession, uh, what they thought were the horrors that the Jews suffered in their uh, exile. Uh, dispersion, which was nothing compared to what was uh, going to come later in the Holocaust, but that was enough for them. And they, they basically knew that the land was practically empty and that, uh, I mean, there were people there, but it was practically empty and it made sense that uh, both for, uh, from a, a biblical uh, prognostication for those who had a religious orientation and also a humanist uh, view uh, that this evil of history, this injustice of history would be corrected, that this long-suffering people, the Jews who contributed so much to, uh, to a civilization uh, and, and to history uh, and to morality, the idea of morality, it's the Ten Commandments, <laughs> you know, that became the code, the moral code of the world, uh, and so many other things, the, the birth of Christianity, the, many of the ideas, the moral ideas that we have originated on these hills where I'm sitting in right now, this tiny, uh, you know, dusty edge of Asia, where this tribe, <laughs> strange tribe lived here and talked about, you know, man's, the fact that people should not remain slaves, that there should be a, a law that uh, applies to all of them, that kings are not divine, that <laughs> they're subject to... Uh, moral authority and censure and all sorts of other crazy ideas like that. It's all originated uh, uh, here. And so uh, the educated leaders that met in World War I after uh, 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 the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, uh, they had to decide, you know, who gets what. And they came upon the idea of self-determination, that is that people should have 
you know, the, the ability to govern their nations, obviously with civic rights for other peoples living in their midst. And they concluded, knowing the history that I just described, that is so unknown today on college campuses and uh, among so-called uh, intellectuals who are anything but that, uh, that, uh, that the Jews deserved this right to rebuild the, their national life and their ancestral homeland. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that's how it developed. But the first one to actually bring it forward, you mentioned at the beginning of your comments, was Theodor Herzl. Theodor Herzl uh, was a giant of history. He, he was a journalist. He was a Jewish, uh, Jewish journalist in the, uh, the late 19th century. He was born in, uh, in Hungary, but uh, worked for a very prestigious paper in Vienna. Uh, when he was uh, uh, dispatched to Paris as a correspondent, he saw the, the, the infamous Dreyfus trial, where a Jewish officer mm -hmm. uh, in the French uh, army was falsely accused, as it later turned out, of uh, espionage and betrayal, uh, and uh, was sentenced to Devil's Island and other horrible things. And he said this, if this can happen, if this can happen to the Jews uh, in the apex of uh, Western civilization, then it could happen anywhere. And he predicted that within a few decades, the fires of anti-Semitism would consume the Jews of Europe, that they would be slaughtered. He actually saw that. Uh, he wrote uh, uh, these things in uh, uh, 1900, roughly, and before. And of course, the Holocaust came less than half a century later. And he said there's only one solution for this. The solution is to have the Jews, the, the solution is not going to be to integrate the Jews in, uh, uh, in societies, uh, because that's not going to work. The, the solution would not be to eliminate nationalism uh, through communism and other cosmopolitan uh, internationalism. Right, That's right. not going to work either. Uh, and in fact, he was right because so much of anti-Semitism came from Stalinism and so on. Okay? It's not merely Nazism, it's Stalinism too. So either thing, it's not going to work. He said there's only one solution. The Jews should have a nation of their own. That is a country of their own. And he sought to persuade first the German Kaiser, and uh, after that the uh, uh, Ottoman uh, uh, Sultan in uh, Istanbul to give the Jews a state of their own, and he didn't succeed. He died after eight years, that's it, eight years. But in these eight years, he launched this movement that turned the dream of ages, you know, century after century, next year in Jerusalem, he turned it from a prayer, from a dream, into a practical plan. My grandfather, Nathan, uh, Nathan Milukovsky Netanyahu, he was enthralled by Herzl. He became uh, a tremendous uh, speaker at the age of 20. Thousands of people crowded to hear him throughout Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, Poland. Uh, there were records, press records, which I give them, how people fought each other. They broke windows. They fought physically to hear this young man speak about the Jewish, about Herzl's vision coming back to the, uh, to the Jewish homeland. Well, Herzl died. He died too early. And his followers continued the dream even though he was dead. My, fa my grandfather was one of them. My father was one of them. But they didn't succeed. So now we fast forward. In 1917, they succeed partly because, uh, because the British Empire, which now, after the defeat of the Ottomans, controlled what is now the land of Israel, decided to give the Jews a homeland. They didn't say it's state yet, but they said a homeland. It was clear it was a corridor to a state. This was met by fervent Arab opposition, by many of the Arabs who had immigrated to Israel, uh, to the, what is now the land of Israel. They said, no, nah, stop, can't come anymore, okay? They decided we're just gonna oppose any Jewish land. Uh, and the British backed down. They backed down from the so-called promise they gave. It's called the Balfour Declaration, where they promised the Jewish homeland. Mm -hmm. They backed off, okay? Uh, and now, uh, the Jews are stuck. They're in Europe. They can't migrate because Jewish immigration was effectively blocked by the British, who uh, betrayed their promises to the Jewish people. Uh, and, um, and now Hitlerism rises. 1933, Hitler rises to power. My father, who later became a great historian of the Jewish people, he's all of 23 years old. And here's what he writes with the rise of Hitler. He says, Hitlerism will annihilate all the Jews of Europe and 
uh, it's racial anti-Semitism that would consume every last Jew. And the only way we can fight it is to persuade the civilized world that it is not only the Jews who will be annihilated or threatened, it's their civilization too. This young Ben Sion Netanyahu, 33, uh, 23 years old, writes in 1933, if more people had heeded what he wrote, uh, then perhaps we would have avoided an, uh, a tremendous catastrophe that occurred to my people, but also to the 60 million who lost their lives in World War II. Well, they didn't. Now, my father saw this coming, and a few years later, he went to the United States in World War II, and he sought to recruit American public opinion. He's a young man in his early 30s. He's trying to recruit American public opinion to recognize that it's not merely our, for, for the sake of justice, doing justice with the Jews who are being incinerated in Europe. It's for American interest and Western interest to have a strong Jewish state, a strong Jewish state. And finally, you know, he makes his way up, up the ladder because one official hears him, brings him to another, because he argued something that no Jew had argued before, no Zionist leader argued before. They all argued the moral case, which we've been discussing at some length in this book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But my father, he didn't, he didn't abandon the moral case. He argued it with great passion. But he turned, when he, went, when he talked to statesmen, as he taught me, when you talk to public opinion, you talk about justice. And you have to argue the justice of your cause. That uh, those who are unjust do the same, so you may as well do it uh, to protect yourself against the, the people who lie, the people who cheat or present themselves as moralists while they blow up babies deliberately, okay? Speak of human rights while they trample human rights. You have to argue justice and speak the truth. But when you speak to statesmen, as my father told me, you have to tell them you have to speak of interest. That is what my father did. Mm -hmm. And at the end of World War II... Well, that seems to be what you did with the Abraham Accords. Exactly right. That by, exactly. Also by allowing or by facilitating Israel's development into an economic powerhouse. Exactly right. You also made the country, you helped build the country into something that could be practically allied with, as well as, let's say, making them simultaneous... Well, exactly. Days. And that, uh, that's and, really... And, you, you hit exactly on, on the vision, because my purpose in life inherited from my grandfather and from my father uh, and my fallen brother, my brother who fell while leading the, uh, the most celebrated rescue uh, mission in modern times, the uh, historic rescue of Antebbe where he, he died. Uh, I described that moment when I learned about it in some detail and also what happened there, which is uh, not fully known. Uh, but I inherited from them uh, a life of purpose and the purpose was to assure the prosperity, security, and permanence of the Jewish state insofar as you can offer anything permanent in our world. And to do that, I realized that Israel had to be not only to fend off the false claims uh, that tried to deny its, uh, its legitimacy as a state and our historic rights and our ancient homeland, but quite separate or complement complementing that is to make Israel very powerful because history is very unkind. And productive, and productive, not just powerful, right? Because the, the other, other advantage you had with the Abraham Accords was that you could present Israel as a compelling partner in economic development to Arab states that were actually hungry for a pathway forward out of their unidimensional dependence on oil wealth, for exactly example. Exactly right. Uh, when I say powerful, I don't mean militarily powerful, and that's exactly what I, I, I point out in, in the book. And I said, normally, if you ask Israelis before that, what is powerful? Well, powerful means uh, having a strong army. Uh, I concluded very early on, having served in the army, I served in a special unit, uh, uh, an elite unit, and I described my brushes with death and clandestine missions and uh, far into uh, enemy, beyond the lines of enemy lines and many firefights that I was in. Um, in one, I nearly drowned in the Suez Canal. In one, I was shot while rescuing, uh, uh, while taking, uh, uh, part in a, a rescue of ostriches in a hijacked plane, and so on. So I, I had intimacy with the military, obviously, because I was also a, I also served uh, for five years in this special unit as a soldier and officer. And it's quite a, it's a big adventure story, as you you must have read. But uh, 
But I, I understood early on that to have military power, you have to pay for all these things. You have to pay for F-35 aircrafts. You have to pay for submarines, for tanks, for drones, for cyber, for intelligence. It's all very expensive. How are you going to pay for it? Oh, well, in Israel, semi-socialist Israel that I grew up in, it's very obvious. You tax the rich. Well, the problem with that is you don't have enough rich people and they're all going to leave to other places with lower taxes. So I figured that the way you can uh, actually enable Israel to be strong militarily is you have to make it strong economically. But to make it strong economically, you have to completely overhaul Israel's economic system from semi-socialism to free market capitalism. And I entered public life uh, essentially with that view and I became uh, first prime minister, then finance minister, and again prime minister. And I, I uh, led a free market revolution that turned Israel from basically a supplicant to one of the most advanced economies uh, on earth. Uh, uh, just to give you an example, when I became, when I was, uh, when I was uh, uh, first elected prime minister, Israel was well behind all the Western European eco economies, certainly the United States and Canada, in terms of uh, per capita income. Well, as a result of the changes that I put forward and I described in the book, Israel became, uh, in per capita income, uh, wealthier than Japan, France, Britain, Germany. It's actually outstripped them all. And the power, my vision was that the fusion of free markets uh, and technology, which we invest in all the time in our military, that produces this tremendous efflorescence, economic efflorescence, and that gives you the power combination. The power combination is not merely the military, which you can now afford. It's the te civilian technology, which you now develop. And so Arab states could see, well, Israel is a strong country, and with enough resolute leadership, it will oppose Iran that threatens both of us. But Israel also produces uh, fantastic desalinization. Israel produces uh, tremendous developments in energy, tremendous digital developments, tremendous developments in health, and so on. We were the first to leave COVID because of our databases that we developed for the population and so on. Uh, we were the first to exit COVID uh, and uh, rebuild our economy very quickly. So the combination of civilian technology and military and intelligence capability produced this desire on the part of the Arabs to make peace with us. And you know, the attitudes, those ingrained attitudes, anti-Israel attitudes that are still rife in the Arab world begin to change because here's what happened. Because I could make these peace treaties with the Gulf states, hundreds of thousands of Israelis now fly over the skies of Saudi Arabia, land in Dubai or Abu Dhabi or Bahrain, and Arabs there <laughs> embrace the Israelis who are coming there, and, the, and Arabs and Jews are dancing in the streets. Now they're making joint ventures together. You know, they have uh, uh, economic interests, but also the views, the the the. Uh, the cartoonish uh, uh, absurdities of Arab propaganda are dissipated with this human contact. So the new kind of peace that we have, a peace based on, on power and interest, is actually changing the previous assumptions about Israel in many parts of the Arab world. My goal, uh, and I say this uh, openly, my goal, uh, if as I hope I'll form a government very soon, is to continue the expansion of the circle of peace to the rest of the Arab world. But I don't think it's, it's going to be actually a quantum leap again, a quantum leap again, because there is a country there that is a close neighbor uh, that is extraordinarily important, and that's Saudi Arabia. And if I can, if I can achieve a Saudi-Israeli peace, we will be well on the route of ending the Arab-Israeli conflict, and we'll be left with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict but it will be a lot more manageable and we will have changed history. The idea is peace through strength. It's an old idea, I didn't invent it, but the strength that I'm talking about is the combination of economic, military, and diplomatic strength. I call it the, the three pillars of peace. Do you have a coffee lover on your holiday shopping list? Black Rifle has all the best brewing gear, thermoses, mugs, and apparel designed for folks who love country and coffee. 
Black Rifle sources the most exotic roasts from around the globe. All coffee is roasted here in the U.S. by veteran-led teams of coffee experts. Stuff your Christmas stockings with the latest roast from America's Coffee for 10% off with the code JORDAN. Better yet, sign your Secret Santa up for a Coffee Club subscription. Imagine the joy of a pre-scheduled coffee delivery, your favorite roast when you need them most. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Black Rifle Coffee Company is veteran-founded and operated. They take pride in serving coffee and culture to people who love America. Every purchase you make with Black Rifle helps support veteran and first responder causes. Go to blackriflecoffee.com and use promo code JORDAN for 10% off coffee, coffee gear, apparel, or when you sign up for a new coffee club subscription. That's blackriflecoffee.com with promo code JORDAN for 10% off. Black Rifle Coffee, supporting veterans and America's coffee. Could, could you walk us through what you did on the economic front? I, I have two questions there. What did you do on the economic front to move Israel from a relatively far left leading socialist state to a free market economy? So that's, I'd like to know the details. And second, why do you think that given the radical success of your free market maneuvers, that the more socialist vision was so attractive to Israelis for such a long period of time? So let's start with the first one. So tell us what you did on the economic front to to allow for the emergence of this Silicon Valley-like miracle in Israel that's unfolded over the last, what, about 15 years, something like that? 20 years, yes, exactly 20 years. Uh, 20 years. What did I, well, the first thing I did was, uh, if I can borrow a phrase from the Clintonites, never let a good crisis go to waste. We had a tremendous economic crisis in uh, um, when I took over uh, uh, as finance minister in 2003, uh, horrible things. And uh, the country was still along semi-socialist lines. And I decided, uh, and most people thought it was because of the collapse of the dot-com markets, if you remember that, which it was, but it was a tiny factor of it. It wasn't a really important one. Uh, or they thought it was because we had terrorist uh, attacks, which was also part of it. But I thought it was a structural problem. Why were we, before the dot-com collapse, before this or that explosion of terrorism. Why were we, a gifted people, a people with a pretty good educational system, how come we were trailing uh, all the countries of Western Europe? Uh, and the idea was, well, education is enough. If we have good education, we'll get well. That's hogwash. I mean, the Soviet Union had tremendous education, and they had tremendous mathematicians, tremendous physicists, tremendous metallurgists. They were dirt poor. And yet when any one of these people was put on a plane and someone managed to smuggle himself to uh, Palo Alto, they were producing wealth within days because you had a free market there. So technology by itself doesn't produce wealth. Free markets and technology, free markets do produce wealth. But free markets with technology produce unbelievable, unbelievable spurts of growth and wealth. And that was my vision for Israel. I had this crisis now, and I said, in a crisis, I could do imponderable things. I could do things which were never accepted. So what I did was, you know, I spent, uh, first of all, I was, told by, I was told by my advisors, having been prime minister before, and now being a prime minister in Sharon's government, they said, uh, who's in the 70s, they said, look, if you want to be prime minister again, whatever you do, don't take on the finance ministry because you'll have to cut budgets, you'll have to do horrible things, and you'll never be prime minister again. And I said, well, what do I want to be prime minister for? It's to put off, push back the Iranian threat, including their quest for nuclear weapons, and to liberate the Israeli marketplace, so the Israeli economy. So if I achieve at least one of those goals, that's a pretty good thing. They said, okay, but you remember, you'll never be prime minister again. This is 20 years ago, okay? I became prime minister, finance minister. He used the crisis. After three weeks of working 20-hour days, I put forward my vision to Israel, which answers your question. I said, uh, I fell back on a vision because people were living exactly as you say in semi-socialist Israel. They were awash with false economics, basically saying, divide the pie, divide the pie, don't increase the pie, okay? That was basically what they all grew up with. And unless you get mugged by reality, it's very hard to change it. But we were being mugged by re economic reality again and again and again, and we didn't change it. Now comes my opportunity. 
three weeks into my being uh, uh, taking up the fun finance ministry, I gave a press conference. And I fell, fell back on my first day in uh, the military, in basic training. It's a long line. Uh, uh, the company's put in a long line uh, on a big square. And the commander uh, uh, points to me and he says, you, Netanyahu, look to your right. Put the man on your right on your shoulder. I did. He then looks at the, uh, the next guy, puts the guy on his right, on his shoulder, and so on. Well, I had a pretty big guy on my uh, shoulders because the commander blows the whistle. Barely took a few steps together. This is a race. It's called the elephant race. The guy at the bottom is the elephant. The guy at the top rides the elephant. The next guy was the smallest guy in the, in the, in the platoon in the company, and he had the biggest guy on his shoulder. He collapsed on the spot. The third guy was a big guy, and he had a relatively small guy, and he shot off like a rocket and took the race. And I said to the Israeli public, all national economies are pairs of a private sector, of a public sector, sitting on the shoulders of a private sector. The private sector is the one that produces the wealth, or most of it, okay? The added value in the economy. And in our case, the public sector became too big, and we were about to collapse. We were about to collapse like the guy next to me. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to put the fat man, this became known as the fat man, thin man uh, <laughs> example, and taxi cab drivers and comics spoke about it. It, it actually went into the Israeli cycle. Mm -hmm. If you ask people now in Israel, fat man, thin man, they know what I'm talking about. The fat man at the top, okay, we're going to put on a strict diet. Very hard to do politically. You're going to cut government budgets, okay? And the thin man at the, at the bottom, we're going to put a lot of lungs a lot of oxygen in his lungs. And what is oxygen? Well, many things. But number one, number two, and number three is low taxes, low taxes, low taxes, because that's why people risk, uh, you know, that's why they work, that's why, because they don't want to pay it to the fat man at the top, they want to have it themselves. And once we have that, we have to, the, the guy can race forward, right? Run forward and take the race compared to other economies. Well, not true, because as he begins to run, he hits a ditch, and then he hits a wall, and then he hits a fence. And these are called barriers to competition. We have to deregulate the excessive regulation that semi-socialist Israel had, and still has to some extent, but we've, we've done a lot there. So it's three things. Compress the fat man, uh, lower taxes, and do other things to make business very attractive and easy, and remove barriers to competition. And frankly, that's what I did. I, described, I don't describe the 80 or so major reforms that we did, uh, but I did them in a crisis. And the reason I could get away with it in a crisis is because, you know, things are so bad, they were so bad that they let you do it. But I paid heavily and I almost disappeared from politics. <laughs> when, I, when I later ran for, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, as a, the leader of Likud, my party compressed to 10% of the Knesset. That's it. Right now we're the biggest party. But I, I was nearly destroyed. So my advisors who told me, don't take the finance ministry, weren't that wrong. I was declared dead. Having survived several uh, uh, brushes with death as a, as a commando soldier, I now uh, survived the brush with death politically. So I was eulogized. People said Netanyahu great, did great things in the economy, but he's dead. <laughs> he's, he's down to 12 seats out of 120 in our parliament. It's finished. Thank you for what you did. Go away. Okay, I recovered from that, and I was reelected. So why did you pay? Why did you pay the price? Like what? Oh, why? What, what was it about your reforms that that made that price inevitable? Because yeah. part, first of all, the most important part is that uh, in order to put the fat man, the public sector, on a diet, uh, I had to uh, I had to cut back Israel's lavish welfare system, which encouraged people to live on the dole and not to go out and work, okay? So when I cut uh, child allowances, which in Israel were extraordinary, they'd go up with each successive child. So, you know, by the time you got to the sixth child, uh, you know, and you had, like the Bedouins in the Negev, they had 60 children from multiple wives. They could drive the BMW Jeep as their second car in the sands of the Negev. I mean, and this was leading to demographic and economic uh, collapse, okay? And the same thing was happening in other sectors, uh, the ultra-Orthodox community and so on. They didn't work. They just had a lot of children 
which the others, uh, you know, the public, the private sector had to pay for. And when you cut that, well, Jordan, you, I can tell you, you don't become very popular, okay? <laughs> it's not mm -hmm. cutting government. Well, there's a lot of short-term pain there, eh? That's, there's short-term immediate pain that's concrete for a lot of people when you cut. And if the benefits only kick in in the medium to long term, then you have a, well, then you have a, obviously a problem of emotion. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd the like cost it is to... up front and the benefits later. You're absolutely right. And, and, uh, and you have to be prepared for that. That's what leaders do. If you want to lead, you have to have a purpose. And your purpose has to be beyond yourself. And you have to be ready to shed political blood, your own. You have to be ready, otherwise you can't lead. Otherwise it's meaningless. You're always looking at the polls, you're always looking. Do you have a vision of what to do? I had a clear vision. And I wanted to make Israel a power among the nations. And the, the things, and I paid for it, and I nearly died politically. In fact, I was eulogized twice, because you gotta realize that uh, I checked, you know, somebody sh showed me the statistics the other day. So uh, I'm the longest serving prime minister of, uh, uh, of Israel, 15 years, and in a year, uh, if I, as I anticipated, will form a government in a few days, in a year's time, I will be the longest serving uh, leader of a democratic country in the last half century. But I'm already uh, uh, beating the odds in a different way, because a lot of people came back once from political death. That's happened. Um, Richard Churchill is an example, uh, Yitzhak Rabin uh, of Israel, uh, the late Yitzhak Rabin was uh, another example, and you, you can find them in other places. Not that often, but you can find them. But the last time somebody came back twice, to do a comeback twice, uh, was 75 years ago, three quarters of a century ago. And the reason that's happened is because you're quite right. If you're able to survive political death, then people appreciate what it is you did mm -hmm. for the country and for them. Uh, even though, you know, you could be swept by tremendous hostile press, as in the case in Israel, but you can overcome that. Uh, and in, in Israel's case, in my case, in the story of my life as I describe it, it was to uh, bring into effect this vision of Israel, uh, of a powerful state that uh, has this tremendously uh, creative uh, economy, uh, along with a powerful military, uh, opening its... Uh, uh, opening uh, the door to peace with its neighbors and also fighting what is a global threat. Uh, Iran with nuclear weapons and inter -ballistic, intercontinental ballistic missiles that can reach to Canada and the United States and anywhere is a threat to all of humanity. And by protecting Israel, by fending them off, I of course protect Israel, but I think we protect the larger international community. People appreciate that. That's why I'm sitting with you a few days before uh, I expect to go back into office because we can have this free-ranging conversation now. I can talk about my book, which I unabashedly am trying to plug in this conversation. <laughs> and I urge you to read it for two reasons. One, as you say, to understand the uh, better the history of uh, the Jewish state, the, national, the Jewish national movement, Zionism, that led it, the, the reality of the Middle East and how it's changing, by the way, for the better, the threat of Iran, all of these things and my contacts with the successive American presidents who are very different from one another, and I've had to deal with quite a few of them, and they're, it's an interesting story. But I think beyond that, I think it's to live a life of purpose. Okay, well, you had to be guided by and have faith in principles that were outside of short-term advantage in order to do what you did. And, and that's the story that you lay out in your book, and that seems to be in accordance with the facts on the ground. When you... In your political experience, no doubt you've dealt with political leaders who have a vision and who are abiding by principles. And then you have dealt with political leaders who don't. And one of the questions I have for you as a consequence is, what is it that you think that the leaders who, don't who aren't guided by principle and vision, what is it that they're pursuing? And in your experience, is that more common on the political front than guidance? by vision and principle? Uh, in general, yes, it's more common. Uh, and that's why people don't have high respect for politicians. They speak of principle, but they're usually interested in personal power. For me, power by itself uh, is is meaningless. Power for what? I mean, I can make a living, better living outside. Well, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Well, that's, that's exactly what I'm asking. I don't really understand. I don't understand the drive for 
power, so to speak, or authority or influence outside of the realm of guiding principle. Because it, it, like, if it's just a shallow hedonism, let's say, or a desire for a claim, I would think also there's there's easier and more productive ways of pursuing that. I I certainly agree with you. You're, you're right because Israeli politics isn't exactly a walk in the woods. I mean. Uh, or a, a rose garden. It's very cruel. And my family and myself was subjected to incredible uh, uh, calumny and slanders and lies. And it's horrible. Uh, so unless you have a, an overriding purpose, uh, there's no point. To come back twice from political death, to have been eulogized, usually unfavorably, <laughs> doesn't, you, you don't come back uh, uh, for the perks of power, which are absurd anyway. I mean, anybody who can learn a living will will do better than what uh, heads of state get in the Western world. Uh, you know, they're, they're forced into a drug code. It's nothing. I mean, it, 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 believe me, you get, you get uh, better accommodations when you're in the private sector. So that's not the reason. For me, uh, right. as I said, I, I've lived a life of purpose to revamp, uh, to, to assure Israel's permanence. My father and my grandfather worked very hard, labored very hard to assure that the Jewish people would come back, would have a state. And I worked very hard to assure that they'd keep a state and that that state would become a power among the nations. By the way, the University of Pennsylvania has uh, this annual poll in which they ask 17,000 opinion leaders in I think 20 countries to rank the powers of the world. And in the decade that I led, led Israel in between uh, 2010 to 2020, Israel was consistently ranked, consistently ranked, as the eighth power in the world. Now you gotta understand, we're one tenth of one percent of the population of the world. You know, we're, we're gonna reach 10 million soon. Ahead of us, our country is with billion people, hundreds of millions of people, mm -hmm. tens of millions of people, and below is the same. But we stand out, this tiny, tiny country. And the reason that's so is because I put this vision that is my purpose in life into being, but it's the, the jury's still out. It's not that you can sit on your laurels. I can't say, oh, well, and I'm coming back in. I've done it. I wrote my biography or my autobiography. That's it. No, you have to constantly work at it. You have to constantly increase, increase the economic power, increase the innovation, increase the circle of peace, expand it, uh, and block the, those who would who trample us. And uh, you know, it's not automatic. It's not obvious that history will be kind to the good. It's not true. History has been kind to the bad. History has been kind to the worst people. I mean, the, the Genghis Khan ruled, <laughs> ruled a good chunk of the world for over a century and created horrible, you know, terrible horrors. The Roman Empire, you could uh, judge it this way or that way, but they ruled through the force of arms and subjugation for uh, hundreds of centuries, okay? The history, you know, Martin Luther King uh, said, the arc of history bends towards justice. Maybe so, but that arc is very brittle. And it could be broken by the most, yeah. the darkest force. And there's forces. lots of variability. Lots of variabilities. And right now, the darkest force in our immediate vicinity is this horrible regime in Tehran, in Iran, that everybody can see its horrors, what it's doing to those incredibly brave men, incredibly brave women who are dying on the streets there. And that, if I say that the arc of history will bend towards catastrophe, if these ayatollahs, these thugs, these uh, uh, theological thugs, would have uh, nuclear weapons and the means to deliver them to every part of the earth. So I've made it my life's mission, so far successful, to prevent them from having that. But it's an ongoing thing. The jury is still out. There are many things. It's, it's not guaranteed. Right, right. Well, part of the reason you were able to offer something attractive to the Arab countries with whom you signed a peace accord was because you had something to offer, as you mentioned before, in relationship to Iran. And so let's talk about the Abraham Accords a bit more. Now, you're going to be moving back into office in the upcoming weeks in all likelihood, and you indicated your, your continuing interest for obvious reasons in expanding the Abraham Accords, and you mentioned Saudi Arabia. If, what, can, you, can, you, can you explain a little bit about your vision of the most likely pathway forward on the Abraham Accord front? Are the Saudis, in, are the Saudis next to sign, so to speak? Is, the, is that beckoning on the horizon? I can't speak for them, but uh, and the Saudis are tremendously important. I, I, I think it should be understood it's not just another country that would be added to the roster of peace. This is uh, this is by far the most uh, 
significant uh, and influential Arab country, although there are some uh, remarkable examples of achievement in, in the United Arab Emirates and other places in the Arab world. Uh, but the Saudis undoubtedly are uh, in a category of their own. And yes, I would like to have peace with them, certainly begin with normalization. But you have to, uh, the answer is, will they be there? First of all, where are they? This is an interesting question. Uh, there's no way that we would have been able to achieve the peace accords, the normalization accords with the Emirates and Bahrain without tacit Saudi approval. There's also no way, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. no way that we could fly above the skies of Saudi Arabia without Saudi approval. Uh, the, there's no way that I could speak the other day as I did when the election's results were known with my Saudi friend, um, Muhammad Saud. He's the, I call him the Likud branch manager. He speaks on Saudi internet, okay? And he congratulates me and he says, Bibi, we're for you. He speaks Hebrew, by the way. We're for you. He visited Israel. Mm -hmm. There's no way that this is done without uh, approval. Uh, why did this change take place? And that could be an indication of where we go from here. The quantum leap in our relations with uh, the Gulf states took place in 2015, uh, when uh, President Obama, uh, when, when the United, or rather with a joint session of Congress invited me to speak uh, before it, on the uh, impending uh, nuclear deal that President Obama was going to sign with Iran. Uh, even though I knew that I couldn't reverse it, I couldn't get two thirds majority in the, in the Congress to re resist it, I thought I could get a majority to oppose it and I did, consisting not only of Republicans, but quite a few Democrats. But I know I couldn't get two thirds. I can't get two thirds in our Knesset, in our parliament, I certainly couldn't get it in the American Congress, but I went to speak there and I spoke by the way, uh, Jordan, I described the speech. I never prepared for a speech like this in my life. And I, I prepare my speeches right up to the podium. I change them on the podium. You know, I'm a stickler for, for the precise word. So, uh, well, I came into, just a, as an, an aside, I came to Washington. <laughs> You'll read this in the second part of the book. But I came to Washington um, to challenge a sitting president. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. And even though you know, Obama was the quintessential example of, uh, of, of a leader who had, uh, was there not for power itself, but for, for a purpose. Uh, he had an ideology. It's just that his ideology clashed with mine. He believed that, uh, you know, peace will produce power, and I believe that power produces peace. And if you ask me to do a peace treaty that will uh, uh, basically uh, uh, leave me shorn of my power, it won't last for five minutes. So we had a difference of views, but it clashed, literally clashed with, with the question of the Iran Accords, which I thought merely paved the way for Iran to become a military nuclear power, which will threaten all of us. So I not uh, lightheadedly, uh, but after considerable uh, deliberation, went to Washington. I arrived in Washington the evening before, I'm gonna go over the speech, and I try to practice the speech. And my sinuses are clogged. I have that condition. And I put more and more newspaper, and they're getting clogged, they're both clogged. And I try to practice the speech, and I'm stopped in mid-sentence, every mid-sentence. And I say to my wife, this is the worst thing that could happen, the most important speech of my life, and I'm stuck because of these horrible nose drops, and I fling them in the air, and they try to give me bowls of steam, they bring a medic, nothing happens. She says, well, sleep it over, and it'll pass by morning. Well, it didn't, and I didn't sleep a wink. I get up in the morning, we make our way <laughs> towards the Capitol building, and I say, what? What in God's name am I gonna do? I mean, I can't deliver a line of the speech. And as we see the steps of the Capitol, lo and behold, like a biblical miracle, the sinuses cleared, the waters recede. <laughs> and I go in and I go, <laughs> I give the speech, which was very well received, very well received. Uh, and here's what happened, and this is the relationship to Abraham Accords. As I'm giving the speech in a joint session of Congress, my delegation receives calls in real time from Arab, these Arab states, some of them, 
And they say, we can't believe what your prime minister is doing. He's challenging a sitting American president, the most powerful man in the world. That led to clandestine meetings between me and these Arab leaders, and I won't itemize the where they were in the Gulf, they were in the Red Sea, they were on a yacht. I landed in a helicopter on a yacht, if you can believe it. My security people said, that's too dangerous. I said, skip it, we're doing it. Uh, and this led to the Abraham Accords that were later culminated with the help of President Trump, and he had an important role here. And I value and I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll mm -hmm. never, never stop appreciating this because I think it was very important. Uh, but it took me a while to persuade right. him. He got very little credit for that, too, by the way. Well, he got all the credit from me. But it took right. me three years to persuade him because yeah. he was going down the Palestinian uh, the Palestinian rabbit hole. Uh, uh, Ron Dermer, my ambassador to Washington, tried to say the difference yeah. between... He said, look, he said, getting a peace treaty with... Uh, I'm not a golf player. So he said, getting a peace treaty with uh, the uh, United Arab Emirates is a 15-foot putt. Getting peace treaty with uh, Saudi Arabia is a 30-foot putt. Getting a peace treaty with the Palestinians is a 150-foot putt through a brick wall. <laughs> so <laughs> it took me about three, three uh, years to persuade the president. What I said to him, and I also describe this in my book, I said in the very first meeting I had with Trump in the White House as president, I said to him, Donald, there are four peace treaties waiting to be plucked, ripe, you know, plums ready to be plucked off the tree. And I itemized the country. And I suggested that he bring uh, an aircraft carrier to the Red Sea and invite me and these Arab leaders there to discuss Iran's security. I said, that will produce peace treaties right, right off the bat. Uh, and he didn't buy it. He thought I was trying to evade the Palestinian track. I said, okay, we'll try the Palestinian track. And we worked on that. And of course, we produced a template, which I think I think is very productive. But the Palestinians wouldn't come. Uh, just as Arafat couldn't make peace any more than he could fly to the moon, the present leadership can't do it because they'd have to give up what is really guiding the Palestinian national movement, which is not to build a state, but to destroy one, the Jewish state. So they didn't go. that didn't go anywhere. And so we tried the other track, the track of peace through strength, the, the, the path of peace for peace, the peace for economy, peace for other things, and boom, it exploded. Now, will Saudi Arabia be next? It's up to them, of course. But I think that uh, this will be a worthwhile goal for me, I believe for, for the entire world, uh, and I believe for the leaders of uh, Saudi Arabia. It could be a tremendous, tremendous change. So why do you, why do you think why do you think the Biden administration hasn't jumped on the Saudi Arabia opportunity, especially given that the Biden administration and the Americans in general would have benefited from closer relations with the Saudis, given the current state of energy, what would you say, uncertainty that plagues the United States and the rest of the world? I mean, it just seemed to me that that, again, that was low-hanging fruit that was just ready, ready to be plucked, because I knew that the Saudis, for example, were on board at least tacitly behind the scenes in relation to, to the Abraham Accords. And it seems it seems obvious beyond belief that a Saudi-Israel peace accord would be of benefit, obviously, not only to the Saudis and the Israelis, but to everyone in the world, especially given the threat of Iran. So I don't understand why this process has been stalled. And so what do you what are your feelings about that? Well, probably for two reasons. Uh, of course, I'll have an opportunity to speak to President Biden, who's been a longtime friend. Forty years, uh, we've known each other since we were both young men. I came to Washington as a diplomat, a uh, young diplomat, and he came as a young senator. So uh, I definitely intend to take it up with him. Uh, I think there are two schools of thought that push back this obvious, uh, uh, this obvious uh, opportunity that you, uh, you described. The first is the Palestinian straitjacket that says... And it still lingers among the foreign policy elites. I mean, they've been at it for mm. decades. They can't let it go. They say, well, no, right. no, you have to. Right. Peace means peace with the Palestinians. Peace in the Middle East. It's not in the Middle East. It's peace in the tiny part of the Middle East between Israel and the Palestinians. But peace with the entire Arab world, that's not peace. Uh, uh, or you can't get to it before you, uh, you know, you get through the 150-foot putt through the Iron Wall, which means you'll never get to it. Right, uh, right. That's the lingering thing among the foreign policy, and it's maybe changing because the Abraham Accords sort of started shaking people up. So, uh, 
to see that there are other opportunities, broader opportunities right. for peace than, uh, uh, than they ever imagined. The second reason is that uh, for Saudi Arabia, I think, uh, making that transition requires uh, continually habituating uh, Saudi public opinion, but also uh, conforming to the broader uh, Saudi interest. There are two interests that Saudi Arabia has. It wants to modernize Saudi Arabia. There's no question that the current uh, leader, Mohammed bin Salman, wants to modernize Saudi Arabia, propel it to, uh, uh, to be uh, an advanced uh, country. Doesn't mean democratic country, not in the way that we think, but look at the United Arab Emirates, or look at Singapore for that matter. They're not exactly uh, European style, Luxembourg style democracies, okay? But they have degrees of freedom in the economy and the life of the people that is obviously very different from what you have in Iraq or Syria. It's a different thing altogether, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm sure that they want to go there, but to, uh, that he would want to go there, but for the Saudi leadership to go there, they would have to, uh, I think, be assured that their national interests and especially their national security interests uh, are protected. And that requires uh, a certain flexibility uh, on the part of those who want them to take this move. I'm talking about the United States. So it may be that, uh, uh, it may be that there's, th there's a lot more to discuss. I'm loath to be more specific. I obviously, have given this some thought, uh, and and I'd like to uh, like to have a go at it. Obviously, very soon. I hope. Hello, everyone. I would encourage you to continue listening to my conversation with my guest on DailyWirePlus.com. This is Mike Francesa. Join me each week on the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. This is real sports talk for the podcast generation. Subscribe to the free Mike Francesa podcast today from wherever you get.
Don't run for 
When that storm comes Don't run for cover When that storm comes Don't run for cover When that storm comes Don't run for cover from the coming star well, there ain't no use in running when that rain falls let it wash away when that rain falls let it wash away when that rain falls let it wash away Cause you can't keep a storm from coming